you've done this before. Cool. We're live. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We have got staff for a tight deadline. We're going to be running to close at around eight. So we're going to make the most of it and dive straight in. So first of all, thank you for joining us. It is a lovely sunny evening here in Devon. So um, thank you for staying inside with us. We really appreciate it. Um, so a little bit, um, I'll just do some screen sharing if that's okay with Dave, who is no, taking control. Cool. So a little bit about um, Product Tank and, <laughs> hi Dave. Not me. Um, <laughs> product Tank and uh, Mind the Product. Uh, it is the l world's largest product community brought by product people for product people. So there are two different um, aspects. There is Mind the Product, which is, uh, as it says here, the global, the global professional network for product people. And then part of that is Product Tank, where each, lots of cities all around the world, you can join in most places, you will find a product tank um, run by individuals who are putting together events just like this one, really. Um, it's really, really cool. If you aren't already, you can get involved and you really should do. There's loads of different ways that you can get involved. And the best way to do that is to find out some information um, at mindtheproduct.com. So I'll hand over to Tor in a second, who is going to introduce Steph. But first of all, just a quick thing to say we'll be taking questions all evening um so please go to slido which is sli.do and use the um use the sign up code ptx um so please use that get involved send in your questions we're really excited to hear from you over to you Tor. perfect you want to flick forward here we go okay um, yeah, so uh, we're delighted to welcome Steph with us this evening. Um, I We don't have time to talk about Steph's full, <laughs> full work history. It's so long and extensive. Um, but uh, Steph's currently uh, Senior Director of Product Management at Google, um, leading the uh, COVID-19 uh, exposure notifications effort. Um, previously, Chief Product Officer at the fitness app Strava. Uh, and uh, earlier still was Chief Technology Officer of Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential election campaign. And the list goes on and on before that, but we'll touch on some of those other roles, I'm sure, during the conversation. Um, so uh, it's great to have Steph join us. Steph is coming uh, from the snowy peaks of Utah, mm -hmm. um, where it's equally a lovely day, as we saw earlier. Um, but I thought uh, for those of you who you know haven't uh, had an opportunity to uh, to read the backstory, it would be great, Steph, just to maybe start with a quick summary of kind of how you found yourself in product management and where it's taken you. Well, first, thanks for having me. It's such an honor to be with this community and honored to be with my old friend, Tor. We worked together at Google for a very long time, but more importantly, we're friends and neighbors in Sydney, Australia for many years, and it's so lovely to see you. Um, my journey to product, uh, maybe like many people, started as a computer scientist. I was a software engineer for the first six years of my career, and I loved it. But I think um, being a software engineer it felt very micro, like the things I built and the things I was responsible for were small pieces of this big puzzle. And I think as a person who loves talking and communicating and um, sort of maybe um, even people management and people development was sort of something I liked from an early age. I thought the product path was a way to have more influence, to have more um, scope over strategy, to be more a part of uh, designing or creating the thing we were building versus owning a, a piece of the building. Um, and I think it was also influenced my first job out of Stanford. I worked for Andy Bechtelsheim, who founded Sun Microsystems. Anyone born after <laughs> 1980 probably doesn't know what that is, but um, that was a very big um, computer technology company. Uh, and I worked for David Sheridan, who was a distributed systems professor at Stanford. And I also saw sort of the best hardware and the best software architects in the world coming together at our first company. And, and I sort of saw those people and I thought, well, I'm not exactly like them. What's a thing I can do and I can be world class at? Um, and, and that was sort of the path to product management. So I switched into product management inside of Cisco. And then product management at a hardware company is totally different than what happened in 2004, which is when I joined Google 
as a product manager and sort of started on Gmail and operated at a speed of development that was like a thousand X anything I had ever seen at Cisco. So that was sort of my journey there. Amazing. And then uh, I guess product management must have been a relatively young discipline at that point. Um, I mean, how, to what extent did you have to figure out what that even meant and, and how, how has it changed since then, do you think? I feel like even in 2004, Google is a pretty well-developed job function. Maybe yeah. there were only 100 of us, but it, it was a pretty well-defined job function, though it might have been young in the industry or the world writ large. Um, I think at Google, probably Tori felt this too, it always we were always told that we were the mini CEOs like from day one. They're like, you're the mini CEO um, of this project and you're responsible for all the things it takes to get it out the door, to be successful, to iterate, to make it great. But PS, you're not responsible or have direct authority over anyone. <laughs> so in a company like Google, the product managers report into one set of people, but the designer somewhere different, software engineer different, legal different, marketing different, customer support different, analytics and data science different. So it's sort of like from the very beginning, it was how do you move this pretty ambitious giant ship forward? Because my first product was Gmail and I joined only three months after launch. And soon and that was the throes of where people were still trying to remember if it was an April Fool's, Fool's joke. <laughs> like, is this really a thing? Is Google really going to host webmail? Um, and so in that way, it was... It was sort of um, a big learning curve because, you know, especially in an organization, Google was already a couple thousand big people at that point. It's it's sort of how do you navigate? How do you do your job? And when you work on something like Gmail at Google in 2004, you're not important. What's important is web search <laughs> and what's important is AdWords. And anytime there's a debate over machines or resources or people or engineers, you lose. And so a lot of, you know, I think product management is being scrappy and building business cases and starting small and using 20 percent engineers and just trying to navigate how to get, you know, small, small progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I joined Google, I guess, a couple of years after you. And I think there were about three and a half thousand people when I joined. So they must have been more like 2000 people at that time. And now I think they're 135,000 people, something like that. So how has that, uh, I mean, how has that changed the experience, but also how has it changed the way you have to navigate an organization like that? It's radically different today at Google, but I almost think when I came back, because this is my third go around at Google, <laughs> keep returning. When I came back in um, uh, 2013, I was responsible for all, for all location services on Google Maps. And so location services is at the heart of everything Google does. It affects our business pages. It affects ads. It, it affects everything and um, Google Now and, and all these different pieces. And so then in 2013, I really felt like I was at the middle of a giant company where like any small change, like even the smallest privacy permission change or even the smallest like data history, data collection change, months and months, if not longer of navigation and approvals and buy-ins and whatnot. Like it just, it's so complex when you have the success, I guess, of a Google um, and the reach of a Google. What I do now is totally different. When I came back to Google in, in July of last year, it was primarily um, and intentionally to work on this COVID project. Mm -hmm. Everything is different about this project because it runs independent of Google. You know, the code base doesn't touch and, and have anything to do with the rest of Google. There's no product integrations with the rest of Google. And 90% of my day is spent with Apple. And so <laughs> Google and Apple are sort of significant competitors in every other walk of life. And then in this one you know, um, initiative for the public health good for the attempt to save lives and prevent the spread of infection, we are partnering tightly. And we built this platform together and we launched countries and states together. And so I kind of think this project is operating at warp speed. And I'm so proud of it because in the last seven months, we've launched more than 80 apps. That's some combination of 55 countries and 25 states. Um, have hundreds of millions of users and and have just done, I think, a lot of good. And so product managing this <laughs> initiative, <laughs> nothing I've ever done at Google before or really in my career. And have you noticed any sort of significant cultural differences between Google and Apple that you have to navigate? <laughs> so many <laughs> <laughs> on this lovely public forum where all my <laughs> Apple friends are probably listening in. I mean, what I am impressed with at Apple is they um, like the, 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 the sort of 
decisions happen at a very high level, like mm -hmm. high level. And once there was like a buy-in to do something, for example, in our express version of the platform, which um, Apple built directly into their operating system. So if you live in a state like California or um, Washington state or Maryland or Colorado, you go on your iOS phone, you just turning it on as a setting. And that's a pretty dramatic decision to take a product, which was an app and put it into the OS and that Apple decided at a very high level. And then they just did it and they did it really fast. Mm -hmm. On the Google side, we've kept it an app for a whole bunch of different reasons, partially the complexity of our ecosystem and what it takes to roll out a new Android release. Um, but that's like a, a just difference where Apple moved really fast and made a really big dramatic decision. I feel like in Tor, you know this, Google's a very ground, like individual, you know, crowdsourced feature roadmap product planning process. And so on our team, like ideas come from anywhere um, and that's great, but sometimes it maybe turns out to be a little bit less cohesive of a roadmap. Um, and so we're doing a lot of um, joint product planning now. Um, and because they're a operating system feature now, their, their lead time has to be like six or seven months. And so mm -hmm. today we're considering like an example, a feature we're debating is whether to collect vaccination status. Do you collect it from the person who's potentially sick? And do you collect it from the person who's been exposed? Mm -hmm. And if we want to do that and add that feature, we can do it in about three weeks. But if Apple wants to add that feature, it takes many months. And so just kind of figuring out how to do product planning together when we're on such different horizons has been an interesting lesson. Yeah, yeah, that, that actually kind of resonates a little bit. One of the questions that's come up on Slido, which is, I think also harks back to what you were saying earlier about working at Cisco and working on hardware products. It's like, how does, what's been your experience of the differences in product managing software versus as like a software hardware combinations? Yeah, well, I mean, slow, like Cisco was slow <laughs> because we were like literally building things onto ASICs and the ASICs would be like manufactured and tested. And then like a year or a year and a half later is when they would go into wiring closets. And so you just, you have to make these forward leaning decisions and have a little software control later. That's what I felt. Um, uh, maybe a more modern example, I guess Strava is interesting because it's very hardware device um, hardware platform dependent because people suck in their data from their Garmin watches or their Sento bike computers and the sort of API platform aspect of it is is really dramatic. And so I remember one of my first projects there is we unbundled our subscription service and we made it into packages and what seemed like not a trivial project, but it was a pretty um, manageable three month, you know, unbundling process inside of um, Strava turned into such a complex ecosystem when you have hundreds and hundreds of device partners who have like branding elements like buy this watch and upgrade into Strava premium or do this thing and get Strava premium or get a trial of Strava premium, just like the complexity of the ecosystem sort of adapting to this new world um, was a surprise to me because I probably wasn't living in that <laughs> in that space so much mm -hmm. anymore. Um, so yeah, I think the biggest difference is, is just like the lead times. Um, and then the level of confidence, like we all make bets on product ideas that might or might not work. If you're a Strava athlete today, and I hope a lot of you are, you might notice that the unbundling of the subscription service, which we launched in 2018, mm -hmm. in early 2020, they reverted and they went back to one package and one price for everything. And so that kind of like iteration and fast learning and and doing experiments and deciding that they don't work and unraveling them or doing something different is something you can do so often in software and in hardware, you just have to make much, much longer, maybe less risky bets, I think, um, because of just the inflexibility. Mm, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, obviously, COVID is an exceptional situation that arose very quickly um, with no real notice. Um, and I remember uh, around the time that you, not long after you joined Strava, I think there was sort of a a bit of a crisis as well there. So I'm kind of curious as to your, your sort of a, how you approach product management in a crisis uh, and kind of that peacetime versus wartime kind of working style, I guess. Yeah, yeah, of course. It feels like I am 98% of the time in a crisis tour. So <laughs> I might have one side of it and other guests might have others. <laughs> um, but as you know well, when I joined Strava, I think my third week, on the job, I was, um, I woke up to a headline that said Strava exposed secret military bases around the world. Not good, not <laughs> a great headline. 
And it turned out we had launched, we didn't have a lot of discovery of routes. So if I'm a cyclist and I'm in a new town, I don't know where to go. We didn't have a lot of route discovery features. And so we um, built this really amazing tool called the heat map, which is just what you think it is, like a graphical navigatable um, interface where you can like drill into a city and see like which routes are most traversed. Um, and what happened is we didn't have any sort of filter on number of times a route had be, been traversed. We showed everything. And there were some people who had recorded and made public routes in, in what would be sensitive areas. Nothing that the world hadn't already seen, like nothing that was new information, but it's still a very serious and important um, concern and, and something we had to address. And so to your point about um, crisis management, product management, the, it was only, I'd only been there three weeks. So the first thing I had to do is like, did, is, is there a bug? Like, is something wrong? Did something leak? Are these not public routes? Is the product not working as expected? And so that was the sort of first probably eight to 12 hours. And then, okay, it's working as expected. Um, and, and then it sort of went into, okay, what are the mitigations? Like one mitigation is to pull this whole feature down, like pull the heat map down. And that's something we debated at the board level, you know, not just with the leadership inside of the company, but it's a very dramatic thing because to me, pulling it down meant we did something wrong. And I felt mm -hmm. very strongly that the heat map was a good feature and a useful feature. And 99% of the use cases were valid and, and important to athletes. Um, and so then it's sort of, that's the first battle is like, what do we do? Um, should we take it down? We decided to keep it up. Then the next thing is what changes should we make? At that time, we had only promised to publish it like once a year or once a quarter. I can't remember. And so the next thing was like, okay, well, let's commit to publishing it more frequent, frequently. Let's add features that make it so a route has to be traversed a certain amount of time for it to be visible. Let's make it um, so the zoom levels are not as deep. And then let's give people choice. Like if you don't like it, if your route is here and you don't like it, here's how you change it in privacy settings. And then next time we refresh the map, it'll be gone. And so that was like the probably first, I don't know, three, five days. Mm -hmm. But the bigger question to me was it exposed a lot of complexity around the privacy settings on Strava. I don't know why I said quotes. I apologize. <laughs> All the, the real privacy settings. <laughs> but quotes. Um, we had like at odds privacy settings where one thing was like, do I want to be a hidden athlete? Like I don't want people to see me on Strava. I don't want to be discoverable. And that was one setting. And a different setting was I want to be on leaderboards. And if you mm -hmm. said yes to being on leaderboards, you had to be public because leaderboards had one, two, three, four, like chronological order of athletes in terms of speed. And so if you said, I want to be hidden and I want to be on leaderboards, those two things can't coexist, but on settings, you could turn them both on. So then there was a whole product iteration around that. So the, the arc of it tour was sort of like tactical near term, like mm -hmm. management with like, okay, how did we get here? What's the root of why some people are confused or they don't understand this behavior, even if it's working as intended. And then I think the most important thing for any product manager, like if I can say one thing I've learned in all these situations, same working at the Hillary campaign, like crisis after crisis, this is just your job as a PM is to diffuse, like not <laughs> elevate. Like I'm, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at this. I have definitely, like, I can remember situations where I came into the room and made it, like elevated it, like caused more panic or more kind of chaos. And then I look at moments like the Strava thing where I was like, okay, my job is to diffuse to take the energy out of the situation, to be practical, to get facts on the board, to get an action plan, to project manage through it. And then like, that's when you're winning. That's when people like, remember like, oh, having stuff there was like a good thing is mm -hmm. when you diffuse the tension and diffuse the chaos and, and, and be action oriented. Sounds good. You mentioned the campaign there. We can't we can't not mention the campaign, mm -hmm. um, but actually I'm gonna bring Dave back because Dave has a connection. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, for my sins, I studied politics at university and ended up uh, as a tech intern at the DNC in 2012. Oh. So uh, uh, I have a, a limited insight. Um, but I, I think just what would be useful is we're expecting that most people watching tonight are going to be sort of UK based. Um, the the way that the UK does politics in the US are, is increasingly converging, but actually the, the sort of US election machine is quite different to the UK. So I wonder if you could just sort of give us a bit of context as to kind of what goes on in a tech team at a campaign. What products are you building? Because it's it's pretty different. Sure. Yeah. So I think what's important for maybe this audience to know is um, the 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 cycle in in the U.S. is very long. So I got hired in April of 2015. 
for an election that was happening in November of 2016, right? So I was 20 months on this campaign. And when I got hired in April of 2015, almost everyone on the campaign had been hired. <laughs> like the tech staff should not have been the last people hired, but we were. Um, and that's just, I think, a, a signal of that, the like technology intelligence is sort of like nascent. Dave, I'm sure you felt this, like getting the tech awareness, product innovation into a political campaign is a hard journey because it's so urgent and people really like to rely on, on products and technology they know, even if they don't do the job or aren't as flexible mm -hmm. or cheap as they could be. Okay. So first thing is it's a long cycle, 20 months. The second thing in the U.S., if you are not the incumbent, then you are going to be in a primary battle first. So I was working for Hillary Clinton, who was a Democratic Party candidate. So was Bernie Sanders. So were a bunch of other people. And so first you have to win the nomination for your party. And that's a series of primaries or caucuses um, that happen between February and June of the election year. And so the first battle you're fighting is to win your party nomination. And only once you win your party nomination, then you kind of compete against the, the candidate for the other party. Why is this important? In 2016, we had hoped winning the nomination for the Democratic Party would be over in like a month. So the first primary was, I don't know, February 1st. And we thought, okay, by March, we're going to be the nominee. And then we focus on the true, you know, fight, which is with our, um, the other party's nominee. What happened is we were fighting Bernie Sanders till June. And the reason that's so important is you build a different set of tools to win primaries or caucuses. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looks different. It, it, you're you're kind of doing different things, um, and the general election is different. And just the sheer, sheer, you know, we might have ten or twenty thousand people walking the streets during the primary, and knocking on doors, canvassing and knocking on doors in America is a very big part of democratic politics. People don't like it. Nobody likes a stranger knocking on your door, but it's again one of these like historic tactics. And then when you get to the general election, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, not a, if not um, half a million mm. people, knocking on doors. So the types of technology our team built, we built and launched 55 products-ish. We built a lot of things around um, fundraising. So in the US, it takes a billion dollars to run a presidential campaign. That's one B, one billion dollars. I know it's insane. We could talk for hours about that. <laughs> a lot of what we built is infrastructure to raise money and infinite experiments, like hundreds of experiments run every month to say like, okay, if, if it's a one screen versus a three screen, if it's above the fold, below the fold, if you have blue versus green, if you mention Katy Perry versus Bill Clinton, if you save a credit card or don't save a credit card, if you give a bumper sticker, you don't give a bumper sticker, like infinite money experiments, a lot of voter activation experiments. So we want to get her supporters out to vote. You know, just because somebody is supporting her doesn't mean they turn out to vote. It's not compulsory in the US. We want to get people registered to vote. Um, and then we want um, undecided people to change their mind or, or pick our candidate. So there's a lot of technology and tools around all those pieces, especially voter registration. We built all the field organizing tools. So in the end, our field organizing program was part knocking on door, part phones. And then the real innovation, which I, I'm sure the world will not thank me for, that we pushed in 2016 was the text messaging, like activation by text messaging, trying to get people to turn out to vote, to turn out to an event by text messaging. And so all the field organizer tools for all of those programs were built by our, our tech team. Mm -hmm. The analytics infrastructure, modern elections are a lot about how you slice the data and how you know how to spend your limited resources on. Like, should she go to Pennsylvania this month or Florida this month? Should she do small group events or 20,000 person stadium rallies? Um, how much money should we spend in these different districts? Like all of those things are data driven. And so we built all the analytics and data science um, platforms and tools. Um, we built her, her website. We built like a storytelling part of her website. We built one-off tools like a college debt calculator because that was one of the big differences between her and Bernie. He said free college and she said debt-free college. Mm -hmm. And obviously free college is way easier to understand. So we built like a website to try to explain it. So Dave, sorry, that was a long arc of a story. No, I, I, think it, I think it illustrates the breadth of what you're doing is, is, is there's just so many products. I mean, that my first thought is just how on earth do you spin up that many products so quickly with a small team? And it sounds like you're just trying to do, you know, I mean, startups are crazy, but startups with a kind of political, we're here because we think this is also going to save the world kind of thing must be super crazy. Yeah. I mean, how, how on earth do you manage all that? How do you prioritize? 
yeah, stuff. That's, that's just impossible. <laughs> I always said because I have this audience now who has, who's trapped here listening to me that like it was like the biggest startup of 2016 that nobody knew about because in one year we raised and spent a billion dollars and one year I hired and fired 80 people and one year we launched and then took down 55 products. So it was like on a scale that was so epic. And the hardest thing was finding the people because when I started in April 20, April of 2015, I was there by myself. So all of it was just imaginary, Dave. Like the first thing I said to the campaign manager is like, okay, the only thing I can do for you right now is try to get up a website and a donation link. I'm like, that's the only thing I can do. And I'm doing it with volunteers because I have no people. And then I was hired six days before she publicly launched her campaign. And so while the ship started to sail and she went on this like road trip to Iowa and it was a huge moment. In the meantime, I'm like calling every human I know, <laughs> seeing who will come, you know, work on this campaign and leave the Ubers and the Stripes to take very teeny salaries and, and, and come and build political tech tools. And in April of 2015, nobody thought that was urgent. So a big part of it was like finding the needles in the haystack who would be like, yeah, I'll come help you. I'll do this thing. Um, and so, and then how do you create culture? Like who was going to do my interviews? Like I had no people to do interviews. Um, how do you pick the right people? You know, I had some people coming from political tech, some people from Google, some people from small startups. I remember having like so many like angry fights between people about MongoDB and like sort of <laughs> like weird unconscious bias about like tech that I had never anticipated. And yeah, it was just like, and then I, <laughs> I like so many people from the campaign who haven't dealt with like an integrated, the idea of like having a tech team building stuff integrated into the campaign was so new. A lot of people just came in and say, oh, I want you to turn on, you know, MBO, my MBO. And it turns out like, what's that? It's my Barack Obama. It was one of their digital organizing tools in 2012. And first of all, I was like, number one, I've never heard of it. Number two, we definitely don't have it. So number three, tell me what you're trying to do. And this is, I think a big part of why they hired a product person to be the CTO. Like it was an unusual choice to hire me but it was, it was things like that. And I was like, okay, the, the challenge is we want people in not battleground states like California and New York to help us in battleground states. In 2012, it was through digital organizing. What should it be in 2016? And like, that's a product question. That's a thing where we can ideate and brainstorm and bring in experts and try different things. But it was sort of getting the campaign comfortable with that. I don't have the thing you're asking for, <laughs> but I'm going to go try to figure it out. And the other thing I said like 90 times a day was like meet Google spreadsheets, like meet Google forms. <laughs> <laughs> because people would be like, oh, we're doing this event and we need a check-in tool and we want people to walk the lines with, you know, an iPad and do this thing. According to like, WP oh, forms, seven best Google. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking. Um, anyway, so I'd be like, okay, yeah, that check-in tool is just going to be a Google form, like meet Google forms. So every day was sort of about ruthless prioritization and figuring mm -hmm. out what are we going to build ourselves? What are we going to buy or pay for? And what are we just not going to do? Yeah. Do, would you say yeah. that's getting easier as more and more tools exist in the world that are open source or is it getting harder because there's just too much choice and people are going, I use this and I like this and uh, someone's saying, no, we're comfortable with that. In the political world, it's not getting easier because there's very little carryover to between cycles. Like, and that's something like Nell Thomas, who's the current CTO of the DNC, is trying to change. I think she might be the first person who can <laughs> change it because she has persistent staffing. Like, she did not lose her 2020 team; they're all still together, and that's different. You probably felt this, Dave, that normally the DNC somewhat um, disbands all of the staff right after the election's over. Um, so I yeah. think Nell has a help, has a hope of some of the persistent technology and having that investment carry over election to election. But in the past, it's all kind of disappeared. Like that's why I didn't have my MBO from Barack's Obama's team. I can't believe I just called him Barack. Like he's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> we all think he's our best friend, really, in our hearts. <laughs> um, but but I do think there is a higher investment. Like there is an incubator in the U.S. called Higher Ground Labs, which is focused on political tech. And there's um, yeah, there's just more interest and in, in investment now. So I hope that gives choices. But I will say this: that political campaigns are always strapped for money. And I saw time and time again when the party pays for something, like the DNC or DCC or DSCC or any of these committees paid for something, the candidates would just take it, even if it wasn't the best, because it was free. And so mm -hmm. I think that's an unusual dynamic in campaigns that we're going to have to tackle, because mm -hmm. the best technology might not be free, and then it's going to come down to a lot of other things. Yeah. Well, so one of the things, one of the things that did surprise me, I remember when, when we were talking afterwards, was I realized that, you know, that, that you worked for Hillary, you didn't work for the Democratic Party per se. And so, as you say, when it's done, it's over, everything just gets 
you know, they, it's a clean sheet and, and nothing gets carried over. Um, but does that also, is that one of the things that helped you move quickly because you didn't have to worry about long-term maintenance and support of this stuff? Well, I would just say, Tor, it doesn't have to be that way. So I worked mm. really hard to change that way so that the code that we made in Hillary got transferred to the DNC, like they had all of our code. So that was okay. a choice we could make. But the DNC didn't have any tech team at that time. So what does it mean to get 200,000 lines of codes? Mm -hmm. Some of the tools we did build, like we built something for monitoring, helping lawyers monitor illegal activities around polling stations on the day of election, like that lived on and it was used in all the subsequent elections. So number one, it doesn't have to be that way, but it takes work. And especially when you're the losing team, like not a lot of people wanted mm -hmm. to hear my thoughts after <laughs> 2016 for a lot of reasons we all understand. Um, so that was the first thing. And then what was your second question? Well, just did it, did it, did actually that help you move quicker because you didn't have to worry about long-term maintenance? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think in some ways it helped move quicker because we were able to uh, pick all the best. Like we could use any tool we wanted and native react and like whatever thing. And it helped me recruit engineers to be like, oh, you just got out of boot camp. Like here's a learning ground where you can work in these like modern spaces. But it also starting with a green clean slate or an empty space meant I had to do everything, like all of the infrastructure choices, all of the tool choices, all of the cloud choices, like all of the everything. And so you're not starting from like a place of like, okay, I have a stable platform I can add to. You're mm -hmm. just starting with nothing. So in that way, probably those first four or five months was just like, oh my God, what tools are we picking? How are we going to manage bugs? How are we doing this? Like what, you know, there was just a lot of like getting started stuff that I would have liked to skip. Hmm. So I've got, I've got uh, one other question stroke topic. It'd be good to cover. And then perhaps we can bring Hannah in to go through some of the slider questions. So uh, again, if you're watching and you'd like to pose a question or just vote on some of the questions that have been suggested already, head to Slido. The code is PTEXE. Um, and uh, we've already got a bank of questions building up there. But the question I wanted to, to ask before we do that is, um, I, I remember a, a few years back, uh, sitting in on a talk or a panel, I think you were doing at South by Southwest. And um, uh, and I thought someone asked a really interesting question, which I'm gonna uh, uh, replay. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for any trauma it causes you. But I think you were asked a, a question about kind of how you handle failure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you didn't talk about the campaign, you talked about something else, something mm -hmm. near and dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> if I had to guess, I had talked about Google Wave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's no trauma. Like, I think the best thing a product person can do is talk about failure. And <laughs> failure is not bad, especially fast failure is, is not bad. It's all about do we have a growth mindset? Like, growth mindset is, I think, what makes a successful PM. Um, so I probably talked about failure because, as Tor knows, I was the product manager in Google Wave, which, again, if you're Born after 1990, you probably never heard of. It was a bet Google made. Um, we launched in 2006. It was sort of an integrated um, chat, document creation, photo sharing, ch you know, chatting everything in one platform. And the closest analogy to it today would be Slack. So just imagine we might have been on the cusp of inventing Slack in 2006, but a lot of things went wrong and. Um, we didn't make it. So we were we launched in 2006 at Google I.O., standing ovation, a million users within a year. Um, but in Google, a million users doesn't mean a lot. That's not a big success. Um, and it was also at a time when I think Google was about to lift up the Google Plus project and sort of trying to get into social networking. And I think Google had thought we were a consumer product when really we ended up being more of a collaboration tool for enterprises or small teams. Um, and so Tor knows this, that like that is so hard because it was a big public giant visible launch and then a big dramatic public canceling. And um, I think the the things I try to take away from from the failure is just like, what did I learn? You know, a lot of I could talk for hours about what, what went wrong. But I think one thing we tried to do with Google Wave is make it a product, a platform and a protocol at once. We were essentially trying to replace SMTP and you can't be like, we're replacing the concept of email, but you only get to choose Google. So we wanted a protocol where SAP or Oracle or IBM or anyone could put up a Wave server. And also the founders of Wave were the founders of Google Maps. And a lot of the success of Maps, as Tor knows, is the API platform piece. And so we were like, well, we can't do all the wizziest stuff. If we have an API, then other people can build stuff into Waves. And it's not a bad concept, but I think there's a difference between telling a story about <laughs> these three giant things and building them all at once. And we built them all at once. Um, we also did a bunch of things about 
how waves and email coexisted. And we made some choices that I think didn't help in the early days when we had a limited beta and people weren't constantly living in their wave inbox. Anyway, so one thing with failure, you can be reflective. Another thing is you can try to figure out how to talk about what did you learn? I think a lot of the technology components we build, which were innovative, like if you're in Google Docs today and you are typing with other people and you see their names and their carrots going around, that's all Google Wave code like that. We found its way into Google Docs and I think that's really cool. We had this drag and drop from the browser, from the desktop to the browser piece that ended up in Gmail, that was really cool. And so like finding homes for pieces of the technology, even if the product didn't win, is a success. And then also just like learning how probably, Tori, I can't remember what I said that day, but part of it is just learning how to like, not absorb the energy of people asking you questions with like words that feel charged to you. Like, why was it a failure? Because mm -hmm. I could be on my back foot and I can be like, well, <laughs> I'm not a failure and this product is not a failure. And like, um, you know, you can get really like up in arms when it's emotional. And I worked on that for three years and it was a very difficult thing when it shut down. But then you can just think, oh, okay, well, what is this person is really just trying to understand? Like, why did this product not work? And, and it's okay to talk about the kind of dynamics of the company or what was important to Google at that time or what we might have done differently or what could have been if we were not inside of Google, but an independent startup. So I think all of that tour is, is maybe some of my, my lessons or learnings. Sounds good. All right, can we bring Hannah back? Hey. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So shall I run through some of the questions that have got the uh, the most votes on our Slido? That sounds uh, good. The main, the most upvoted one, which is one that we see a version of quite a lot when we talk to people is what is your process for identifying the right product metrics? Yeah, great question. Every product person should think about that question. And it, to me, looks and feels different at each company or product, and it might look different when you're launching versus, you know, you're two years in or when a new feature comes out. It's probably easiest to talk about the COVID thing I'm doing now because it's the hardest product I've ever tried to support or build because by design, Google and Apple don't see the data. Like part of how we built this and told the story to the world that we were gonna um, do this crazy thing with Bluetooth and phones, you know, phones are basically talking to each other all the time and keeping a 14 day history of all devices you've been near. And if uh, um, a person becomes sick, their public health authority gives them the code, they enter it into the app. And then anyone who was in an exposure window with them gets a notification. The idea is to get you to quarantine and test very fast. So you're not out there spreading um, spreading and making it worse. And so for a, a product like that, like easy metrics to track are like how many people downloaded it? How many people still have it on their phone? Like uninstalls is something we look at a ton because you know people turn it on and then a month later they're like, is this really helping me? I don't know. And then they turn it off or, or uninstall it. Um, things that PHAs can look at that we, we built the infrastructure for them to see, even though we don't Google see it, or something like how many notifications are sent. You know, if you're in Ireland and you're sending, you know, 10,000 warnings a day of potential exposures, it's probably helping. If you're sending two or three a day, it's probably not helping. Um, so things like that. We give um, sort of, um, how do I say this? Uh, bands of sort of number of people exposed by different risk models because we try to get people to more aggressive risk models and so giving tools to the PHAs to say like oh if we moved our risk model to be a little more less conservative more aggressive what would happen how many more people would we notify but the magic metric for my product is something I really can't get from the technology alone because what we really want to know is if somebody first found out they might be infected by the technology like if you are, if we notify a hundred people and all hundred of them already knew because their mom told them or because they're in bed sick or because they got tested, then we didn't help. But if you first knew to get tested because of the technology, then we're doing something really important. Then we got you information faster than any of the other channels you could have found out you were sick. And that's really hard. And the only way we found out to do that is by surveys. Um, or asking people, like having the contact tracers who often talk to COVID positive people on the phone, did you have this op app on the phone and, and did you first know to get tested because of the app? So Hannah, that's just like a one specific instance of this product and the types of things we think about, you know, inside of Google and, and running a, a social network for athletes. And, you know, a lot of things we looked at and cared about was sort of like, um, you know, cohorts of your first week on Strava. Like we figured out if you uploaded one activity and got two likes, then you were like five times as likely to still be with us in a month than if you didn't. 
And so we work really hard. Anyone who's ever had an onboarding experience in Strava, we work really hard to get you some likes fast because that that's what makes you feel like you're part of a community. And that's totally different than Google Maps and sort of what was important because we're not, Google Maps isn't a social network. It's not trying to get you there every day <laughs> to like look at something on the map every day. It's a utility, but when you need it, we want you to choose maps and we want it to serve your needs. And so a lot of features around the quality of your experience there. So yeah, great question. Those are some of the things I've thought about. It's really interesting being a Strava user myself. Now you've said that, I think, oh, actually I'm prompted to like other people's activities and stuff like that. It's really interesting seeing it from, from the other side and listening from your experience. Okay, so the next question uh, we've got uh, is again, a very common one this year, which is that the big theme at the moment is working remotely. How are you finding collaborating remotely? Uh, do you look forward to going back to the office? I've heard that Google are bringing forward their return to the office. That's really exciting. I don't think bringing it forward, but I think I think we're still on track for September. I should probably know this. I apologize. I know I have a Google friend here who I just met, so I don't actually know. Um, I do I miss it? Yes, I miss people. I definitely miss people. It's been really weird because I returned to Google in July of 2020 to work on this COVID project. So my whole duration of this project has been virtual, and all the people I've worked with, with like three exceptions, I've never met in person. Um, so yeah, you, it's definitely like hard to not have those personal connections and the informal hallway talks and the like yelling over the cubicle. Like I miss all of that. Um, I do think my team is uniquely distributed around the world. Like we aren't all in Mountain View or all in an office. So I don't even really know what it means to return <laughs> because we're in Seattle and New York and London and Singapore and, and all over the world. So I miss it. Um, I think, let me think about it. Um, tactics that have helped us maybe survive this virtual world. Like I, I do all sorts of like, you know, silly games and icebreakers to try to create personal connections, celebrate birthdays, celebrate new people joining the team. Um, yeah, like photo sharing, like what was an interesting photo you took this weekend? I don't know, just like lots of things like making space while you're doing something, especially as intensive, crazy as what we're trying to do. Like a lot of our meetings are at 10 at night or on the weekend. We have a lot of emergency situations. I, I can probably say this out loud because it was very public. Like in August, we drained the battery of like 70% of the smartphones in Ireland in like two hours. Like, I don't know, something really bad. And so you're like working through these like crisis situations and there's so much drama. And so I guess making time and space for like caring about people, asking about their mental health, trying to create personal connections. That's all been kind of important to me. That's really, really important. You're right. The next question we've got is that you've worked in some radically different fields. How do you approach acquiring the necessary domain knowledge and how important is the rapid acquisition of such knowledge in those fields? Is it just about hiring the right people or do you need to learn yourself really quickly too? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you to the person asking for noticing. I do feel like uh, that's something that fuels me. You know, everyone in your career figures out what gives them energy and and what gets them out of bed and excited to do the work, especially when you're working uh, long hours on on really hard problems. And I like learning. So like um, this person said, I've, I've thrown myself into like very radically different situations, even learning how transit system works, you know, to build Google Transit was its own process. And in 2011, I left Google to do a startup in the energy efficiency space, and I learned how to install HVACs, and I designed a thermostat. And, you know, you just throw yourself into these different situations. I say it's super important to learn the space yourself. And um, for the Hillary campaign, I started in April, as we all know now. And within two weeks of starting, I got on a plane to Iowa. Iowa is the first caucus in America. It's always the most important caucus. And because of that, a lot of energy and dollars and, and candidate time is spent in Iowa and I just went there and I was like, you guys have to teach me how grassroots organizing works. Like you have to put me like not, you know, it was still like giant sheets of paper. Um, and I was like, giant sheets of paper? This is how people are going to do canvassing. And so they like gave me a giant sheet of paper. They showed me how they cut turf in a tool. And they just like threw me out of a car in Iowa <laughs> with like this paper. And I remember standing in front of the first door and I've never been involved in politics and I've certainly never knocked on a door and I was just like, there's a piece of the paper where it checks, like person wasn't home. And like something about this door, there was like a scary dog and it looked really worn down. And I was like, I'm sure this person <laughs> behind that door is going to kill me and doesn't want to vote for Hillary. 
And I was like, who would know if I just skip this one door and like, just don't do it. But you know that I did, I knocked on the door and I like knocked on a lot of other doors. And then I tried to do a mobile version of it and see what the most modern tools were for mobile canvassing. And then I sat with the field organizers and I watched them do their jobs and I like followed them around. And like, that was the only, cause I had no idea what it took to run a political campaign. Like Dave, you were asking me about all the tools we built. Like if you told me day one, like write on a piece of paper, what you think this job is it would have been very different. <laughs> like I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but like immersion was really key. And so I forced every single, I hired 80 people on the Hillary for America tech team. And I forced every single one of them to canvas. Even if you didn't work on the field organizing tool, I was like, we are doing the jobs. And I forced all of them to make phone calls. And I forced all of them to go to a fundraising event. And I was like, if we're building tools to amplify how political campaign works, like we have to understand how they work. Um, and I think that was one of the big pieces of our success and maybe even less about the products we built, though, I think it helped, but more the signal to the rest of the campaign. Like we care about what you do. We care about understanding your work and we care about trying to like live in your shoes. Um, so that's really important. And then with public health, um, and the COVID work I did, did now when I was, when it started in February of last year, I wasn't um, working. I was between jobs. And so with a bunch of my friends, we started this organization in the U.S. called U.S. Digital Response. And we just said, hey, we're a bunch of tech people who want to help overwhelmed public health departments who are suddenly dealing with COVID. And in like March 12th of last year, we put up a sign-up form. I think we got 500 volunteers the first day and 5,000 by the third week. And then I just went into the sprint of like, I was personally leading the New Jersey effort. And, you know, I just every day, twice a day met with the public health team and they were like, this is what we need. And every day was different. Sometimes it was a PPE dashboard. I built a automated background check system because they were trying to activate medical staff for um, FEMA uh, emergency hospitals. Um, we built something called Neighbor Express, which was like, I'm an older person who can't get my groceries. I need help. We built new workflows for unemployment because suddenly gig workers in the U.S. were eligible for unemployment and it broke all of the existing systems. So that was a long arc of just saying, I didn't know anything about any of those things, but you like listen to the experts, you spend time with them, you try to understand and, and you involve them in the product development, like ideation and process. And, and those are some of the tactics I've used. You've mentioned quite a lot there about working. I mean, it sounds like you've worked on a lot of areas that have a huge social impact. Are you actively seeking these out or is it something that just really, it sounds like it suits your skill set? So, I think I got into it without intentionally getting into it. I, I always tell Tor that like my first thing on Gmail was I noticed all the universities were forwarding their email to Gmail in 2004. And I was like, why are they paying for these giant Microsoft exchange systems? Google can host their email at a fraction of the price. Hey, Larry and Sergey, can we give all you know, the universities and schools in the world, Gmail for free. And that's just the thing. If you're at Google, you can aspire to do. Like you can just walk into Larry and Sergey's office. They used to have office hours. <laughs> you could walk in there and say something crazy like that. Um, and so that felt very philanthropic. And then in 2006, I went to Zurich and I, one of my first projects was making Google Transit, which had been a bunch of 20% volunteer engineers making it a full-time project. And, you know, living in Switzerland, like you live by public transit. And I couldn't believe Google Maps only had routing by driving directions. And so many people don't remember, but Google Transit lived separate than Google Maps for more than two and a half years. Like it wasn't an easy or obvious thing to put it inside of Google Maps. And so we built that and I did all the transit work. And that was like um, the most, one of the biggest public goods I think I've ever done in my life, you know, is just like making it easy to navigate the world by public transit. Um, and so I think I, I like with those two projects stepped into it. And then I was like, oh, this feels good because I'm at a giant tech company. I'm working on products that hundreds of millions, if not billions of people used, but you can do really social impact things. And so after that, Hannah, I started to seek it out. And I think when I went to Facebook, the job I took was called Site Integrity, like they had a product for Site Integrity. And that was how do you prevent abuse on, on Facebook? How do you prevent hate harassment, nudity, porn, extremism, terrorism, racism, all the bad stuff. But to me, it was like, how do you create a safe space? Like a billion people were in Facebook every day talking to each other. How do you make that safe? And that felt like a social good. So yeah, like I think it started accidentally and now I seek it out. And that's how I ended up at the Hillary campaign. And that's why when I came back to Google, like thanks to Google for letting me do this, I didn't come back and just say, I want to come back to Google. I was like, I want to help with COVID. And I think Google and Apple have this big idea that can radically, like technology can accelerate stopping the spread. And that's what I want to do. And luckily they made it possible and, and I got to come back and work on this. 
So, so uh, just one follow-up question that struck me is, you know, you were talking a moment ago about kind of upskilling yourself in, in new domains. And, and uh, I suppose that my question is, how does that affect the way you approach hiring and building teams? I, I realize that the campaign was a, a kind of an exceptional case, but even in the current context is how important do you feel domain knowledge is, or is it always the case that that's, that you can you can fill in those gaps and it's actually other skills that are more important i think for the product person i don't think that domain knowledge is so critical like being a great product person i think is the, is the most important thing but i think the immersion that we talked about and like learning the space you're operating in is really important one thing i just did at google tour is hire um, a woman from the state of Colorado who had been the person that built the solution there. Colorado, by all measures, is the most entrepreneurial, innovative state adopting our technology in the U.S. They were the first to automate codes. When you're a sick person, if you get your code on the phone from a contact tracer, it probably happens six, seven, or eight days after you're sick. And that doesn't really help stop the spread. If we could get people to automate distributing codes, then you get your code the day you get sick and stopping the spread is more meaningful. Anyways, but we didn't have a single public health state person on our team. And this is one year later since we started the project. So I hired Sarah because I was like, she can give us domain knowledge now every day. All the PMs and the engineers are brainstorming with her. Like, why isn't this promo successful? Like, why isn't this thing we try? Because that's one thing I noticed about the engineers is like, who I could not love more than life itself, but like, it's so obvious them to them to do the things that makes sense technically, like automating verification code distribution, but they don't understand the hurdles or like who are the decision makers inside of a state government or a, a California has 67 local health jurisdictions and there's like a public health um, chief health officer at the state level, but all 67 of those LHJs have their own chief health officer and they own make their own decisions and, you know, can just the complexity gets big. So I think toward the domain knowledge is key, but it doesn't have to be in the product person. <laughs> But the product person has to have like a deep desire to like uh, immerse and understand and really listen, like listening to the people who are the experts felt feels like a big um, success factor on our current project. That kind of leads to, I think, another question we've got, which is what are you looking for when you're hiring product people? Like you talked about the product person there. What, what are good signs that you want to see? Yeah, so uh, we talked about this a little before, but like growth mindset, like I always ask people about failures. Like there's such a different type of person who's like, oh my gosh, that was a disaster. Or, you know, that product didn't work. Or we like made our users really mad. Like at Strava, we made our users so mad. We put like, Hannah probably knows this, we put like a annotation around your activity that was like, I ran with a Garmin 365 watch. And people were so angry. It was like, that's an ad, that's on my data. I don't like it. Or I'm like an athlete and I'm sponsored by this brand Adidas and you put a Nike thing around my thing and now I'm in trouble. <laughs> like so many bad things happened. Um, anyway, so like failure, talking about failure, learning from failure, that's a big one. I think how you convince people to do things. Like I always ask about how like you convince somebody like an engineer or a manager or somebody to do something that they initially didn't think was a good idea. How to use data to create stories, qualitative and quantitative research to create stories. I think curiosity, like curiosity, obviously, because I have been trying to model that on this call of like learning and, and trying new things and being a curious person. Like that's a hard thing to find or figure out how to measure, but um, I care a lot about that. And then just ideation. Like I think maybe I've told Tori this before when, so I moved to Google Zurich in 2006 and, you know, brainstorming ideation, creativity, that's such a DNA of product people. And candidates from different countries reacted so differently to open-ended brainstorming questions. Like, I don't want to pick on any countries, but I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> candidates from Italy were so different than Germany and just being willing to just ideate and brainstorm and, and not have like the perfect answer. I felt like a lot of times, maybe sometimes the German candidates were a little bit more like, okay, I need to get the right answer or there's like a structure or like a perfect way to approach this. That's too generic. I'm not trying to be a really <laughs> generic, but then you just, it doesn't mean they can't be great PMs. It doesn't mean because one has a more of a culture, a DNA of brainstorming. It's not also in the other people, but your job as an interviewer is to try to figure out how to draw that out through your questions or your case studies or through their experience. And so um, that, that's another thing I just care a lot about is like creativity and ideation. Like I always ask people, what's a Google product you use and love every day. Great. Now tell me seven things that would make it better. And they should be super interesting ideas. Otherwise you're not really, you don't have your product hat on when you're like using your tools every day. Cool. Hmm. You notice more that I'm talking faster as we go on. <laughs> when you put this on YouTube, you should slow it down. 
<laughs> barely breathe. I always get feedback like you have to breathe more during during your time. Uh, Tor said that you also like do like part time rapping and stuff, so it just <laughs> made sense. You have we'll muted just yourself. Under it. <laughs> cool. Have we got okay, time so to more questions or I think I think yeah, let's do maybe one more and then we can we can perhaps wrap it up. Um I think this is a good one to end on because it's nice and controversial. Uh, what is this is again the sort of uh, currently the top voted question on Slido that we haven't covered, which is what's one truth you have that often people disagree with? I mean, I saw that question on there, Andrew, and I, did, <laughs> but I was kind of hoping we didn't get to it because I'm not <laughs> sure. Like, let me ask my new friends here. Do you guys have one? Like, you if you have one, maybe it'll help me brainstorm one I have. Do you guys have one? It's a great question. I don't know if it's controversial, but I think tech is becoming so ingrained, it has to be regulated, and that's a good thing. Mm. But there's going to be a real challenge as to how we help legislators understand what good looks like, because the way good tech gets built is completely different to the way many of our legislators mm. understand building businesses and communities and things like that. You know, the the sort of the speed with which tech can create stuff is not the speed at which legislation gets created or potentially yeah. good legislation gets created. But yeah. we've, we've got to figure out how to how to help tech companies build stuff well, because it's also unfair to expect them to figure it all out themselves. Yeah, that's a really good one. And that is controversial. <laughs> Something people love to debate. And, and actually it's, it's one of the kind of the interesting things about being kind of slightly tucked away in the in the corner of the country here is that our local technology scene is perhaps um, it's you know it's quite unique in its own right and one of the ways it's unique is that we have quite a lot of public sector organizations mm -hmm. um, so uh, it just so happens that the kind of the UK's sort of government funded a weather forecaster is based here uh, the hydrographic office that does all the maritime mapping is based not far from here there's a, a big presence for the public health service the digital arm of the public health service down here so i guess it'd be interesting like having worked in kind of fast moving big multinationals having done the startup thing but also having spent some time in kind of that public sector like how how what what would you what advice would you give people who are work who are trying to bring kind of modern technology practices into these more uh, governmental organizations. Um, I appreciate that question, Tori. I can tell you're giving me a break from Andrew's great <laughs> <laughs> one truth thing, which I'm still thinking hard about. I'm going to put in the YouTube comments. If I think it's great, I'm going to put in the YouTube comments. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say like advice I always ask people to think about in, in any product forum that I give a talk on is, um, you know, go do the work, go, like go work in public service, work for government, work for an NGO, work in the UN. Um, work at a political campaign. Like what I felt was so amazing, as hard as those jobs were, your skill set is unique. And the impact you can have where your skill set is unique is like exponential if you go into a Google, which is also a great place to work, but there's like a million of me at Google. And at the Hillary campaign, there was only one of me. And in public transit or in public health, there are very few of us. So first of all, make those choices. But then the flip side to your question, Tor, is you just have to like respect that those organizations don't move at the speed <laughs> or um, aren't as innovative or risk taking as some of the like more traditional tech companies or startups you might be working at. And so a lot of what I did the Hillary campaign was just education. Like every day I sat with the head of the campaign or the chairman of the campaign or the policy director or the field organizing director and it's just like here's what's possible like here's what here's what engineers do and engineers is different than it like i can't tell you how many times i had the talk of like an engineer is different than an it person that's new for a lot of people or this you know very popular mvp slide that showed how incremental like going from a skateboard to a bike to a car it's incrementally useful versus like just putting pieces onto something where none of the intermediate steps are useful. So I had to explain MVP to everyone because the first that we built were real crappy <laughs> and really subpar feature wise. And I had to keep saying like, but more is coming, like mm -hmm. more is coming. So I think those are some of the things like, you know, respect the speed, respect the experts, like try to educate people and bring people along because if you can do that and if you're resilient, then in those orgs, you can just have like incredible impact. Tech build the tools and IT handle the emails, right? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've skirted the email issue. Yeah. Yeah. Had to get it in somehow. That was Thank like the best I could do. <laughs> cool. 
All right. Well, I think we're out of time. I don't want to make you late for your next meeting. I think you need to show everybody your view before you go for maximum jealousy. Sure. For YouTube, <laughs> I'll just show people what living in Utah is like. You should come. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, tough, tough gig. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so this is Utah. It's a really nice place to live. Also is the UK. And um, it was so nice to be with everyone today. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, if you're watching, stick around for a few minutes. We'll just tell you what's coming next uh, in the meantime. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Steph. Nice <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, do you want to stick the slides back up? Oh, yeah, Hannah, could you share your screen again? Mm -hmm. We can stick the slides up. That would be awesome. Yes, on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Need uh, elevator hold music. There you go. <laughs> Just got to get through all the clicking of agreements and things. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, so uh, we have been sort of roughly speaking doing these online meetups with a, a sort of bi-monthly-ish cadence. But those of you who've been um, members of Product Tank Exeter for a few years will know that there's one exception to that rule, which is that uh, every year um, towards the end of May, uh, we have World Product Day, which is um, a day that celebrates product management and product communities around the world. It's actually the anniversary of the first ever product tank, I believe, which is in London in 2010. Um, this year, it's on May 26th. And over the course of the day, there'll be a rolling series of events and meetups online all around the world. I imagine starting probably in like Auckland and ending maybe in Hawaii somewhere at the end of the day. Um, we will be participating in that. If you were with us last year, you know that we uh, were lucky enough to secure Marty Kagan um, for that event. And so we had to ask ourselves, how do you follow Marty Kagan? And the answer to that is dun, dun, dun. with Ken Norton. Um, now, uh, some of you hopefully know who Ken Norton is. If you are unfamiliar with Ken Norton, um, I definitely recommend you check out his blog um, uh, and some of the talks he's done at some of the bigger conferences. Uh, it'll also explain the bringer of donuts references. But it's suffice to say that Ken has been one of the kind of the leading minds in product management and really uh, uh, wrote an incredibly influential article in about over 10 years ago now uh, about how to hire product managers that really framed the role for many people. Um, so we are extremely excited to welcome Ken uh, at the same time uh, for a talk uh, of a similar, similar form, another fireside chat uh, on May 26th. Um, so if you're uh, if you're interested in that, uh, you can RSVP to that event right now, um, and you'll get appropriate reminders. Um, if uh, otherwise, uh, it's been a pleasure being with you all. Thanks to Hannah and Dave for joining as well this evening and uh, and hosting. Um, and we will see you in about six weeks, I guess, something like that. <laughs> yeah, please do please do forward it on. Let people know and come. It's great to be able to do this online. So. Thanks for coming. <laughs>